hello guys welcome to my channel per the title we're going to be speaking about DMX um, basically a lesson in crack cocaine just reviewing his death um, before we get started though if you haven't already please subscribe to the channel if you've already subscribed please hit that like button for us or if you don't like it hit the thumbs down button give us some comments in the chat to let us know if you like the video and put in the comments what videos you would like us to cover if you would like some um, information on different medical things any of that and share the video we would really really appreciate that so this is my very first live, so bear with me. Okay, let's get into this video. If you look on the screen, you see that I have picked this wonderful cover of DMX. And, oh yes, before I start, I'm not monetized. I still need to get my subscribers and my watch hours. So if you would like to support the channel, my cash app is at the top. It is attending physicians. Okay. So I love this cover of DMX. And it also is kind of befitting to what we're going to be speaking on as it appears that he is smoking. But I love this quote. And it says, Everyone deserves the same grace, whether you want it or not. I pray for my friends, family, and even my enemies each night. We are all God's children, and we all deserve the same grace. We're going to start off just a little bit talking about DMX. DMX to me is and ha has pretty much always been to me um, a living legend or an icon since like the first time I heard him I really 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 like that he has always been unapologetic about his love for the Lord always seeking the Lord um, his songs and raps are so positive and he's always speaking like he's speaking with the Lord. And when he knows that he's messed up in life and he's always asking God for forgiveness, he is constantly seeking the Lord's face. And he does it on a public platform. He's not ashamed of his creator. And I just love that. And of course, he has this distinctive voice, uh, this rapsy voice that is just captivating as well anyway let's move on let's get a little bit of a background on who exactly DMX is I want you to see this um, next um, picture this I love, love, love as well. This is DMX and it's called DMX Prayer. And this is just to me the way that I think you will always pretty much remember him as such an normal guy, always praising the Lord always being thankful of where he's come from and everything that's going on in his life. But I'm going to move on because I don't want to be here all day. I'm going to try to keep this right around at the most an hour if we can do that. Okay. So here we go. DMX. Who is DMX. DMX 
birth name, Earl Simmons, was born December 18th, 1970, and of course, we know, um, was given a death date of April 9th, 2021. His stage name is DMX, and it actually came from, he took the name actually from a, a um, drum machine. I believe it was an Oberheim DMX drum machine um, that was um, at one of the uh, group homes that he stayed in as a youth or as a child. However, many people interpreted DMX to stand for Dark Man X. Um, but that's really where he got his name from. That's just a little bit about DMX. Um, we're going to kind of fast forward a little bit of, we know that he had a lot of trials and tribulations as a youth um, with his mom. Um, there was a alleged abuse there. Uh, he spent many times in a group home, different group homes. And, of course, he began and turned to sort of a life on the street. I remember, I believe it was the interview with Yolanda Van Zant when she interviewed him in the studio. And he revealed that he started using, um, I believe it was marijuana at the age of eight. And then he stated that he became addicted to crack cocaine at the age of 14 when he had um, purchased or, or was smoking some marijuana and it was laced with crack cocaine. That being said, passing at 50 years of age, he had basically a lifelong struggle with this addiction to cocaine. Um, getting clean and then relapsing and going back and forth. So he has a long chronic history of cocaine use and or abuse. And unfortunately, according to, um, I have two sources, I'll link them in the description, but one of them I remember was, I believe it was vulture.com um, was the first source that I saw that stated that per the uh, Westchester, Westchester County Medical Examiner's Office that actually provided a manner of death for DMX and that manner of death was acute cocaine induced myocardial infarction or heart attack. That'll be very important as we discuss the effects of crack cocaine as that is the preface of, purpose of this video to get an education on crack cocaine. Also with his manner of death is very important and things that will be discussed. And I guess I can just start uh, speaking about crack cocaine and then I'll relate it to different things that was put out in the media concerning um, his death and um, what all possibly went around about what, what may have contributed to him, to his passing, okay? So we'll just do that like that. So first, let's talk about this substance called crack cocaine. So some people refer to crack as one thing and cocaine as another. In the U.S., um, the Drug Enforcement uh, uh, Administration or Association, the DEA, um, does not discriminate between crack and cocaine. They look at them as the same drug. However, crack is given a more name of more of a diluted, more of, when they say crack, you think of someone who sn smokes, I believe, crack, versus cocaine is a more pure or powdered form of the drug, and that's uh, snorted. Crack is given the name of of a derogatory name, such as uh, 
crackhead, which was a name given to refer to black poor people, um, whereas cocaine was considered wealthy white people that used the drug. If y'all remember the infamous quote from Whitney Houston, crack is whack, I make way too much money to smoke crack. That was in reference to that derogatory um, quote from, I believe it was 1986 when that came about. I think that was just a few months right before they made the anti-drug abuse um, act that made um, crack cocaine um, sales um, I believe a felony or a jail time or something like that. The interesting thing a lot of you probably don't know is that back in the crack cocaine epidemic, 56% of the users were white, where about 10% was Hispanic and 10% was black Americans. However, 79% um, of the people that was severely punished for trafficking the drug was blacks, very disproportionately um, treated. It was a big disproportion, um, disproportionate treatment and the way the blacks and Hispanics were treated and jailed for life or whatever versus the white, um, their white counterparts. But anyway, moving along. So what exactly is crack? Crack cocaine, commonly known simply as crack, or it may be known as ROP, is a free base form of um, cocaine that's smoked. And when it is um, inhaled or smoked, it gives this short, intense high for about five to 10 minutes max. And then there is a lasting effect for maybe up to an hour. And that lasting effect is known as a euphoria effect. And that euphoria effect basically is a feeling of great happiness, of great elateness. It's just a peace and all of your worries are gone away. You just feel so great and so soothing. And that is the purpose of taking the drug. This form of smoking is the most addictive form of cocaine versus the snorting route with the powder form. And as we spoke, it was given the term crackhead, which I, I just despise that name. I don't really like saying it. When crack cocaine first hit the United States, of course, it was back in the 60s, but it really didn't become popular until um, the 80s, the early 80s, when um, President Ronald Reagan was in office. And Ronald Reagan has been accused of placing this drug in the black community for um, uh, several reasons. Um, one was uh, supposedly when we were in, uh, the United States was in debt, we are always in debt, but we were in debt and needed money and this drug was trafficked in the United States and put in the poor communities to distribute and raise money to pay off the debt. That's alleged to be an allegation. Then there was also the, if you remember the, um, I think it's the, it's the Contra, um, the, um, I believe it, I, I can't really think of the name of it, but this was with the CIA involvement. It was a, um, I think it was called the, um, Contra's cocaine or something like that. And maybe the Nicaraguan culture's cocaine back in the 80s. It was a trafficking operation and it was uh, alleged that the CIA had involvement in trafficking it and putting this um, drug in the poor um, impoverished neighborhoods in the United States. This drug first appeared in Miami and impoverished hoods in Miami 
and then it seemed to be allegedly strategically placed in the impoverished hoods of New York City, uh, Philadelphia, Baltimore, um, Washington D.C., Los Angeles, Saint, and um, San, Fran San Francisco. And of course, in 1984, 1985, um, the crack epidemic took off and lasted until around the early 1990s. Um, more importantly, 1994, when the crack was then replaced with crystal meth. And then the crystal meth thing lasted from like 1994 to 2004. What are the benefits of crack cocaine? Well, there's definitely a lot of uh, benefits from the use of crack cocaine. Um, or we'll just say, first of all, there's benefits from using cocaine, period. And I can tell you that, you know, cocaine is an anesthetic. And it is used. It is a um, medicinal drug as well. And while, so it is used um, as an anesthetic as well as there are other forms of cocaine. You have to look them up. But um, if you think of things like um, the C-A-I-N-E cane part, lidocaine, bivocaine, uh, by uh, um those are um what we call um alternate forms of the drugs or um they have a it's an ester link basically they're ester links but you can google that and look that up that's not what we're here we're here to talk about crack cocaine so what is the purpose of this drug so this drug is used as first introduced as a recreational drug and it gives certain things that um, are benefits from using drug. It gives a, we spoke about a euphoria, the feeling of happiness and elatedness. It also gives a supreme confidence. Now remember what who, we're, who this is in reference to for the most part is DMX. DMX is an entertainer. He performs. You remember entertainers always talk about they're in the studio until the morning hours and just the life they live you know they got to be up they got to be alert they got to be confident when they go out on that stress uh that stage even though some of them sometimes say oh they're so nervous it gives a supreme confidence so that is a great benefit uh hit, get get you a hit go out you're confident go out and do what you need to do on the stage there's also a loss of appetite so in the entertainment industry you look you can look a certain way you could possibly get that body that you're looking for because if you're using this drug you're probably not eating because it does um decrease your appetite then there's insomnia so you don't have to necessarily worry about sleeping because this will keep you up so you're able to finish that song or um and do other things and stay up all night in the video in the um studio and then run early to the morning to the um, radio station and promote your album and do certain things. It gives an alertness. So you're not just awake and drowsy, you're alert with this drug as well. And of course, there's an increased energy. So you have the energy and stamina you need to keep going without sleep, performing for 45 minutes to an hour on stage and never looking tired, then showing up at the radio station doing your job you're looking great because of this drug how does it um basically give but the number one thing that most people are are wanting which is the euphoria it does that quite simply through um It's blocking of the reuptake of dopamine. Dopamine is a brain chemical that induces feelings of euphoria. Normally, what happens is, if you see here, dopamine is stored in, I'm going to say these little things here, not to be too technical, but these little blue dots are dopamine and they're stored in these little circles here. As you see them, this is a cell, and um, they're coming through 
And as you see, when they get here, they're released into this area here. And they attach to these receptors. As you see, they bind to these receptors. And they give us a feeling of elateness, everything's okay, peaceful, whatever. But it's not forever, and it's done in a certain uh, form and fashion. We don't get all of them at the same time. We get just a little bit. And then what happens, or what's supposed to happen, is these dopamine circles will go back into this transporter where they are reuptaked back into the cells. Okay? However, when you use cocaine, what happens is the cocaine will actually bind here, as you see here. And once it's bound, the dopamine will not be, once released, will not be able to be reuptaked back into the cell because cocaine is in the way. What's the issue with that? Well, just because cocaine keeps it from reuptaking, it does not keep it from being released. So, what that does is cause increased amounts of dopamine than what we usually see and now you've created that feeling of euphoria for about five to ten minutes or extremely for about five to ten minutes um, that they are going for when using the drug. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, let's see if there's any comments. Well, we have some comments. Hello, Unique. Okay, good, good, good. You can hear me. I hope you can hear me. I'm like, I hope I haven't been talking for nothing. <laughs> and people can't hear me. Okay, we're moving on. So anyway, we were discussing the um, how the dopamine actually works as far as what happens when um, there is a when the cocaine binds it. All right. Then you have the cons of crack cocaine. So as we discussed here, what happens after generally that five, 10 minutes of euphoria, cocaine is metabolized or broken down very quickly in the cells or in the body as well as the red blood cells. So basically in about 30 minutes, Cocaine has a half-life of 30 minutes. What that means is within 30 minutes of using the drug, half of it is, no, is out of your system. So as it is metabolized or broken down and is now, it is released from this receptor and dopamine is able to be reuptake back into the cells. What happens is then all of this dopamine reuptakes back into the cell as it's normally supposed to do. And then your level or feeling of euphoria drops very fast and plummets you down so low that now you have feelings of depression and you're feeling very, very low. Another... Um, problem with this um, use of cocaine is what it does physiologically to the body. One thing that it does that um, you can pretty much kind of tell I guess if you're looking at um, a person 
is that it affects the um, the eye. So if you look at the pupil of the eyes of people that um, use um, cocaine, you can just you can very much see. that the eyes will be what we call dilated. Dilated simply means that the eye is, the black part of the eye is very um, huge. As you see here. So it'll be very dilated, almost taken up the entire part of the eye. Now, normally your eyes dilate to this size, but generally only in the dark. Your eyes get bigger so that you're able to see, and then as light comes in, it begins to um, constrict back down. Other symptoms that you see, and there are some very specific ones that we're gonna highlight in relation to DMX. You also see nosebleeds, nasal congestion, sniffing. A lot of people pick up on the sniffing. Um, you know, when people are talking and they keep going <laughs> and keep doing like that, people tend to like, are you okay? Are you, are you doing, you know, substances or something like that? Tachycardia, which is increased heart rate, impaired movement, seizures, elevated blood pressure, elevated respiratory rate and elevated body temperature and hallucinations as well as the last one you can't really see is anxiety. Those are signs that you will see with people that use this um, drug but these people also may report symptoms such as irritability, restless and anxiety. So you may see that they seem to stay up and walk around and move a lot. They're kind of fidgety. They seem to get irritated very easily and they're anxious about things. Rare symptoms, but we do see them, are sudden death, which is cardiac arrest or death through a seizure, which can lead to respiratory arrest, both meaning that the heart just suddenly stops and the lungs stop working as well. This is important relating to DMX. Remember, sudden death can occur on your first episode of using crack cocaine, or it can occur on repeated doses, chronic, chronic use over time, as well as if you just binge it. Let's say you use it once a year. You still can have a sudden death from that. I've heard people say sometimes, oh, they overdosed on cocaine. If you look at the description that was given from DMX, it says acute intoxication. The word overdose was not used. And generally that's not used because there is no safe level of crack cocaine. One milligram can kill you just as much as maybe 50 or 100 milligrams. So you can't really say overdose in the amounts because we don't know which amount one, which amount is necessarily therapeutic versus will kill you. And a lot of people that have died from with cocaine in their system or um, cocaine intoxication, most of the autopsies have shown less than one milligrams of cocaine in the system. And that pretty much could also be because even in death, cocaine is still broken down and metabolized in the body and in the cells of the red blood cells. So maybe it's, you know, it's just keep um, getting less and less by the time that it's checked. Um, another thing that we see with people that um, use crack cocaine is what we call crack long. So if you look here, these areas here 
should be black. This is how the long should sit in your chest. This should be pitch black. But what we see is some fluffy, look like cloudy things here. This is fluid. It's called pulmonary edema. And this is fluid on the lungs. You also tend to see what we call possibly interstitial pneumonia and um, other infiltrates definitely around the what we call this area here the perihyler region you also have well we'll get into that because I have another picture to show you an infiltration of eosinophils eosinophils when we think of eosinophils we tend to think of people that have asthma um, and they or allergic reactions we tend to see a lot of eosinophils if you don't know DMX had a said he suffered with bronchial asthma as a child so he already had issues with breathing and on top of that he is using crack cocaine that definitely compromises his breathing so if he has pulmonary edema fluid on his lungs and they're filling up with fluid he's going to have trouble breathing because water, fluids, whatever is not supposed to be in the lungs. So he's going to start coughing that up. If he develops pneumonia, many of you have had pneumonia, that gives you shortness of breath. You can't breathe as well. Also, this is another picture, a little bit more dramatic of um, crack lung. And you see in this one, you really can't see any black in the lungs. You can't really tell where the lungs are. This part of the heart is totally obliterated with fluid. And you only see these little areas here of even black that may say, okay, we can see part of the lungs. All of this is fluid. This person cannot breathe. And basically, if you've ever heard us say a person drowned in their own fluids or something like that, this is what we mean. This fluid is in the lungs. They cannot breathe. The lung can explain, expand to um, help them get air in. And they're re really, really short of air. And unless we can get that fluid off of them, they'll drown and die. Another thing you have is what we call... Um, diffuse alveolar um, hemorrhage. Let me get this picture off. Okay. Diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. I'm going to try to explain that to you. If you look here, these are the lungs sitting in the chest. This is the trachea that comes down and it branches off into the lungs. And then branches come off of that branch and for so on until it gets to the very very bottom of the lungs here we have a circle where we're going to look at this little segment all the way down this is your bronchial alveolar duct and then you would have these great black structures that look like alveoli look um like great black structures we call them alveoli uh sacs um or alveoli this is the sac right here and then these little grape structures in here Cocaine causes these to basically um, start leaking blood, right? More than likely from the fluid until they pop and then they start bleeding. So what happens if these little things start bleeding? They must come back up. The avia, This blood will start backing up here and going back up here. But we're gonna to try to clear this because blood is not supposed to be here. So it's gonna irritate the lining of the lung, right? Just as the fluid is doing. And you're gonna to start to cough to try to clear that, correct? Just You're trying to get rid of the fluid that you have 
that we showed you on the x-ray. Now you also, which is probably just kind of water, just as if you have a cold and you're trying to, and you're coughing up mucus. That's things that have gotten in your lungs. You're going to start coughing up blood and you're coughing up blood because these things here are bleeding all the way down here. You'll start coughing up blood. You're coughing up fluid. If you have pneumonia, you're probably coughing up green and yellow gook as well. The lungs are really, really suffering. And eventually, these lungs may actually stop functioning because they're stressed out and overworked. And that is respiratory arrest, when the lungs just cease to function. Another thing that... The um, cocaine does is that it causes um, well psychologically it's a stimulant right so it hypes everything up oh I forgot to say what I really meant to say about that we'll, we'll come back to that it's a stimulant so what that means is it kind of increases everything everything will go up one thing it does in this stimulant um, abuse stage is called what's called a delusional parasitosis. This is a picture of Carl Axel Ekbom, 1907 to 1977. What we're looking at is here the Ekbom syndrome 2 delusional parasitosis. This is what many of you know as. The egg bomb syndrome is cocaine bugs or coat bugs. And this is a feeling where the person using the substance believes that there are things crawling on them. The coat bugs that are crawling on them and you see them always scratching and itching. And sometimes you may see them picking their skin or picking parts of their skin and things like that, trying to get these bugs off of their skin. And basically what they're doing is tearing their skin and ripping their skin off trying to get rid of these um, bugs and of course what happens when you um, tear open your skin and different things like that you're pretty much setting yourself up for um, infections and different things like that because they tend to uh, scratch their skin until their skin is bleeding or damaged. And this is done because of the delusional part. They're actually delirious. It also causes, um, the stimulus causes increased in fever. That can be a fever that shows up by itself or a fever with um, alcohol withdrawal because they also tend to use alcohol. And the other thing they have is called uh, delirium tremors, which is basically seen um, in um, um, alcohol withdrawal and delirium tremors delirium tremens is a um, complication a severe complication of alcohol withdrawal and it causes sudden and severe changes in mental uh, nervous system um, these people tend to start having shakes when they don't have alcohol. Um, they're confused, they hallucinate, they uh, get anxious, they become disoriented. Um, you may see that they start uh, sweating excessively. Uh, they get a, a rapid heartbeat. They become, um, they can't concentrate. And these are maybe the people that you may see showing some type of erratic behavior that seems to come out of the blue. They have symptoms of paranoia and anxiety, which is the most common symptom of crack cocaine use, and the psychosis, which is the most common um, seen with the smoke route. The addiction part, this is the most addictive form of cocaine. However, it has been challenged to say it depends on, number one, it depends on the person, whether or not there is an addiction. And the second part depends on the um, social 
context. So, for example, if someone says, I smoke crack cocaine, but I only smoke it when I'm at a bar. Well, how often are you at the bar? Maybe once a month or maybe every six months and I don't smoke it again, then that person probably is not addicted to cocaine um, because they only do it at a certain time. So that's uh, in social context. Now, when we do talk about overdose, let's talk about possibly when we say um, this person overdosed. Let's say, hypothetically, that uh, a person is, and they would say they asked for a hit. I think that's the, you know, the terminology. And they have purchased cocaine from whoever. And they would say, well, I always take this same amount but they're believing that this is what I usually, um, they're believing that it is the same form that they usually have. However, the issue comes in that what they are now getting has been diluted because whoever is selling it needs to make a little bit better profit. And so when they use it at the same amount that they usually get, they don't get the a same original high so what do they do they inadvertently go on a binge and they'll take another or successive hit but each time they take a hit the high is less and less intense and so sometimes these people will go on a binge if you heard for probably three or more days um, they don't have any sleep and they're just inhaling hits from the pipe. During this binge, repeated hits with increasingly high doses, they are going to become irritable, they're going to become restless, they're going to become paranoid, and before you know it, they're going to have a full-blown paranoid psychosis, they're going to lose touch with reality, they're going to start experiencing auditory hallucinations, and they're going to become violent, um, like I said, they've lost touch with the reality. They may be running outside naked. Things are crawling on them. You're trying to uh, stop them, get them out of traffic. They're going to start fighting you. Um, they're going to become violent because they are in a ty- uh, uh, um, delusional psychosis, full blown. Um, And this is because they're probably using several hundred milligrams or more at this point. And large amounts of cocaine are going to intensify the user's high and lead to this bizarre, erratic, violent behavior. They may, um, you may notice that they have tremors. Um, They're probably stumbling and off of balance, basically because they are experiencing vertigo. And you may see them holding their head like, you know, they're dizzy or something. Um. You may see they have muscle twitches. Um, definitely, you're going to know that they're paranoid just by the way they're acting. And um, what we tend to see with these repeated doses of what we look at as almost like a toxic reaction that would closely resemble an amphetamine poisoning as amphetamine, of course, is a stimulant. As far as we talked about the Drug Enforcement Agency, uh, in the U.S., this is a Schedule II drug, and it has, which means it has high abuse potential. We do use it for medicinal purposes, and um, they, of course, like I said, consider crack and cocaine the same drug. When we talk about the manner of death of DMX, the manner of death that was given, given supposedly was acute intox- intoxication of cocaine that lead to brain death. Let's evaluate that. What do you mean by brain dead? First, let's look at what information we were given. Now, there are some things that I wanted to know a little bit more about how he was found, who found him. Was there a witness collapse? Was there an unwitness collapse? Because that could really, really help me with this. But I don't have that. So I have to go with what I have. 
what we know about DMX is that he's 50 years old. He's a male. He has a chronic history of drug abuse that he himself admitted to since the age of eight. There was supposedly some talk of that he tested positive for COVID-19, um, which would have been an incidental finding once at the um, hospital. Uh, we don't really know if that's true. Like I said, there was an unknown time of collapse. So we don't know if someone found him collapse, or at least I don't know, or if someone saw him collapse. Um, I don't believe there was an autopsy done. His urine was positive for, I believe, cocaine, not the cocaine metabolite, but for cocaine itself. That's very important. We'll discuss that. There was also talk on, um, I believe, uh, someone's interview interviewed him where his friend Gotti stated that there was um, alcohol and crack cocaine that was laced with fentanyl he was positive for COVID-19 and other prescription drugs were also on board I can't confirm any of that Gotti apologized for overstepping his boundaries but he never took back or retracted what he said that I'm aware of. So I don't know if any of that's true or not. Um, but looking at what we have, I'm going to try to break down of what I would have seen coming out to this conclusion. So we know that at 10.03, there was a 911 call placed. What I don't know if was when that 911 call place was CPR initiated. And if it was initiated, was it initiated properly? So I guess we'll just have to go as there was no CPR and there was no post. EMS arrived at 10.09 and found the patient deal next with no post. That is six minutes after the initial 911 call. Why is that important? Remember, we speak about a lot. Um, the brain can generally, a healthy brain, generally can withstand oxygen that is not um, uh, can withstand um, oxygen not to the brain six minutes or less well he has been down at least now for six minutes no pulse and there is no oxygen to the brain then it says CPR was initiated at 1010. We're now at seven minutes. Then we have for 30 to 40 minutes with CPR and excessive uh, resuscitation methods done for 30 to 40 minutes. And then he transported to the hospital or was it a 30 to 40 minute ride as they're doing recessive, recessive efforts? Now, generally, I really know how this works, but let's look at what I believe happened. That CPR or recessive measures were started at 1010 when he has now been down for seven minutes without oxygen to the brain. And another 30 to 40 minutes recessive measures were done and at 40 minutes or more, a pulse was detected. If you do 40 plus 7, you're now at 47 minutes. That is a crucial time period. This is why when he arrived at the hospital, he was diagnosed as brain dead. Now, a lot of people were saying, I believe he was in a coma or something like that. No, that brain dead coma, not the same thing. 
So, first of all, when you look at brain dead and you say someone is brain dead, this is what you mean. If you look at this, it says after five to 10 minutes of not breathing, you're likely to develop serious and possibly irreversible brain damage. This is where we get the six minutes from. The one exception, for example, is when a younger person stops breathing and also becomes very cold at the same time. This generally occurs when, for example, a young person is playing on a frozen pond or something like that. The ice breaks and they fall straight down and pretty much essentially, let's say they drown. The heart, everything stops at the same time. The body temperature is instantly decreased, which means the brain is not requiring, the demand that it requires for oxygen has decreased. And so there is generally survival even after this person has been down for more than 30 minutes versus it there in a warm place, which is why we say, um, you're not dead until you're warm and dead. So we would get this person, warm them up, and then see if they are survivable. But generally, the brain can survive um, longer than um, 30 minutes in this type of situation. If you look at the clock here, it says, at one minute, brain cells begin to die, but survival is possible. That is one minute without oxygen to the brain. At three minutes, serious damage, brain damage is likely. At 10 minutes, many brain cells have died. Not all, but many. The patient is, at this point, unlikely to cover. 10 minutes is very crucial. 15 minutes. What do you know about 15 minutes? When someone comes in with a no pulse or we begin to do CPR, we generally have a rule that we do at least 15 minutes before we call a person deceased. And that is because we know that after 15 minutes without a pulse, that means you're not getting pretty much oxygen to your brain, that the damage is irreversible. We know that at 10 minutes, but we actually do an extra five more minutes. At 15 minutes, it says recovery is virtually impossible. Now, even though we say 15 minutes, most of us do more than that. Sometimes we will keep resuscitative measures trying for 20, 30 minutes. Definitely in children and young people, um, sometimes we go an hour, hour and a half, two hours, just to see if we can um, get the person to uh, recover or get a pulse or something like that. And sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Um, but we tend to give them a little bit more time. Going back, also that was very crucial, I wanted to point out was, oh, but before I get off that, let me show you something, one more thing. When we say a person is brain dead, this is what we mean. This is your brain. This is your brain stem. Your brain stem consists of the pons, the cerebellum, and the medulla oblongata. This is your spinal cord. This is considered the brain stem, these three important structures right here. So when you, we say you are brain dead, that means none of this is working. The importance of all of this, the pons, the cerebellum, and the uh, medulla oblongata, is that this is the area that tells you breathe. As your oxygen level is low and your carbon goes up, this is your respiratory um, center that tells the, that the brain of the brain that tells you take a deep breath, breathe in, which is of course an involuntary thing. But this is where all of that is housed. So when you're brain dead, you are not breathing on your own. You're not doing anything on your own. Your, your, everything that you're breathing, your heart rate is all artificial. And what I was going to say about the pulse, I believe the pulse that was achieved at 40 minutes because of what I know about medicine, 
was not necessarily possibly a true pulse, but an artificial pulse that was due to the medications um, and things used in the resuscitative state, which is why a pulse was regained. And eventually, in an artificial pulse, when that medication or these procedures were off, the heart rate will continue to go down because it's not a natural involuntary heartbeat, if that makes sense. Um, what else do we want to speak about? Oh, the next thing I want to speak about is if we go back to when I told you there are some symptoms that are very, very important that we look at, we look at these in reference to DMX and the acute intoxication that's thought caused a myocardial infarction or MI or heart attack. The three things we look at, as you see right near the bottom, it says elevated blood pressure, elevated respiratory rate, temperature, and if you go up to that T word, tachycardia, that means in increased heart rate. So what's very important here is that when you um, use crack cocaine, your heart rate, your temperature um, goes up rapidly. And of course you get that feeling of um, euphoria all around the same time. I wish I could demonstrate this to you guys, but I can't. <laughs> if your heart is beating so fast, the heart should beat at a certain rate. By it beating at a certain rate, as it opens or relaxes, blood flows in and it fills up. Once that blood is filled up in the heart, the heart closes or squeezes, that's called the contraction, and that blood that's in there now comes out and goes to the rest of the body. If the heart is beating too fast or opening and closing too fast, then the blood is not being um, allowed to fill to capacity. You may be only getting squirts of blood before it contracts and then throws whatever it has out. Well, Yes, it's sort of, if you want to say it's beating, but it's beating erratically. It's beating too fast, so you're not getting the blood in, so you're not getting the blood out. So it's not going to um, the areas of the body that it needs to go in. And that means the most vital organ, the most selfish organ, is your brain. Your brain wants that oxygen that is carried through your red blood cells. It's not going to get it because you can't get the blood through there because the heart's beating too fast. Eventually, the brain is going to, the heart is going to give out because it's so tired because it's beating so fast. And it's going to stop, which is another word, arrest. And you have cardiovascular arrest. Now, we don't generally put cardiovascular arrest as a manner of death. We are supposed to, what is the cause of that? The cause of that for our DMX was acute intoxication of cocaine. How do we know that? Glad you asked. Now, it is my understanding that there was no autopsy. Remember what we discussed about cocaine. Within 30 minutes of cocaine, within 30, um, 30 minutes of use of cocaine, cocaine is metabolized to rapidly in the blood and half life is 30 minutes which means half of the drug is gone so the best places to detect cocaine is in the urine and the vitreous fluid the vitreous fluid is the eyeballs 
the vitreous levels that are in the eyeballs are reflective of the levels that are in the brain cells. Cocaine roughly can last up to maybe 72 hours, four or five days max. And it is detected, I believe, two, um, you can detect it in the urine two to four hours post usage. The most common way we look for cocaine is in the urine. The manner of death was determined based on witness statements, police statements, um, and I'm assuming toxicology reports. Not necessarily toxicology, but um, things that was done pre-hospital by the um, responding EMS as well as in the hospital. And based on that, this manner of death was given. So more than likely cocaine was found in his urine and if cocaine is found in his urine what we can generalize from that is this he used cocaine within the last couple of days because we know that it is only detected for about one to four days, maybe five max. After that, we're looking for a metabolite. The metabolite we're looking for is benzoylaconine, which is detected at about six hours, but based on uses, if usage and frequent use, maybe up to five days, frequent use seven days, but in a chronic user, they can see up to 14, maybe max 30 days. But I don't believe the metabolite was found. I believe cocaine was found. And if, like I said, if cocaine is found, it was used in a four to five day window. It could have just been used, but it was definitely used in a four to five day window. Okay. The best way, of course, is in the hair where it stays for 90 days. Blood and oral fluids is not that great because it's only there for 24 hours. But if you find it there, you know that it, cocaine was used in less than 24 hours. And I'm assuming this was found because of the manner of death being in acute toxication of cocaine. Another thing that also goes with this is we know that the use of cocaine will lead to heart attacks or myocardial infarctions and or MIs. It's just a matter of time. Some people on their first usage. Some people may be on their hundredth use. But it's just a matter of time because we know that it increases the heart rate, increases the blood pressure, and it jumps really up really, really fast and stays up for a while. This is important because if your witness says, and we, like I said, we don't know if it was witness or not or I didn't get that information, Oh, we were just talking and then all of a sudden the person fell dead. Well, that's very important because how many things do you know of where a person is fine one minute and the next minute they're not? Generally, we think of, as health professionals, a heart attack. Given the right scenario. Can we think of anything else besides a heart attack? Sure. If you tell me, oh, we just took a trip from here to somewhere and the trip was, you know, over two hours long or this person just got off a flight and the flight was over two hours long and they stood up or got out the car, walked two steps, died, collapsed and died, then I'm not necessarily thinking of a heart attack. What I'm thinking of is a pulmonary embolism, a PE a blood clot that has discharged from them not moving their legs during the flight, during the ride, not stretching their legs or moving their ankles and keeping their blood circulating the leg. And then once they stood up, they have formed a clot in the bottom of their legs and it came up and 
blocked the basically bifurcation on um, they dropped it so sudden death positive cocaine heart attack why acute intoxication of cocaine so what happens in acute intoxication deaths remember I told you most acute uh, most deaths in cocaine have been found to have less than one milligram of cocaine in the system deaths occur from acute intoxication 25% in people that are less than 45 years of age and are generally within one hour of using the drug the increased cardiac need for oxygen leads to what we call constricted blood vessels which restricts the blood flow to the heart muscle if you restrict the blood flow you restrict the amount of oxygen that can be delivered because oxygen is delivered through the blood this will lead to stress on the heart or cardiovascular system until the cardiovascular system just can't take it anymore and arrest and or stops. So that is how I believe or I guess what I wanted to explain of how um, crack cocaine contributed to the death of DMX. And of course, to warn people to if you know someone that suffers from not necessarily crack cocaine, but substance use, to try to get them help. If you look in the description, we have a um, number that you can call. It's a national number to get help for your loved ones. And so if you refer to the description box, um, that information is there. And that's all. Let's see if we have any questions. Okay, Unique says explain again about the cocaine blocking. Did I explain it again or did you want me to explain it again? Could you elaborate a little bit more? Well, what do you mean by ex cocaine blocking? unique I didn't understand your question I would let you guys call in but I don't know how to do that yet <laughs> so I don't have a link for that but we'll get better been a little over an hour so it didn't see any questions so I'm going to end now I hope you all enjoyed it please don't forget to share subscribe turn on your post notifications send in your comments and of course give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down um, 
to let us know how you felt about the video. Thanks again for watching. See you at the next video.